one and all and welcome back to the analyst of Vajiram and Ravi dated 12th of April. In today's session, we will be covering the current affair articles which are as follows. In the first article, we will learn how ISRO has avoided the creation of space debris in its ExpoSat mission using what? Using the POEM platform. Then we will understand the need and the demand for putting our developmental focus towards Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Then we will analyze the malnutrition concerns of the India. Then we will learn some of the highlights of the CDS Lok Niti survey upon the public perception of governance in India. And finally, we will also understand why is Ladakh protesting and what are its demands. Finally, we will wind up the discussion with very informative and interesting prelim snippet that are important for the upcoming prelims examination. So let's get started. To begin with our first topic, let's first understand the context. So ISRO has stated recently that its ExpoSat mission, remember we covered it on 2nd of January. So that particular mission which was launched using the PSLV rocket launcher, PSLV of grade C-58. It has stated that this entire mission has left practically zero debris in the low earth orbit. So what is this space debris or what is this debris that we are going to talk about? So space debris essentially is nothing but space junk which is created out of discarded human made objects that were once taken up for space exploration. So it could be your defunct satellites or it could be a part of the launching vehicles. In fact, these part of the launching vehicles accumulate or forms the majority part of the total space debris. Where will you find a prominent space debris? So as you know that we try to launch our satellites into multiple orbits. Low Earth orbit, there are polar orbits, there is geosynchronous orbit, there is geostationary orbit. But the majority of it is found in the low earth orbit that is from the space debris, this consolidation of space debris is found predominantly from about 400 kilometers to up to 2000 kilometers. So this belt has to be considered if we are going to talk about the problems of space debris because it is a growing problem related to the space junk. Now what are the rising concerns? And to talk about certain data facts which substantiate these concerns, first of all is the growth of satellite constellation. There is escalation in the deployment of satellites. And not only satellites, we are now growing in our technology, we are also building what we call as anti-satellite tests. Multiple countries are doing, USA has done, Japan has done, China has done and India has also done. Can you name one project of India which has performed anti-satellite test? This was done by DRDO and the mission's name was? What is its name? Kindly note it down in the comment section. Now, once you know that a lot of satellite constellations are growing, it means specifically in the low earth orbit, it means that probably when all of them become defunct, they will remain in that area only. If a defunct satellite is there in that space area, of course it is acting as a it's acting as a junk. So this will also lead to junk rise or debris rise. In fact, in a report stated by European State Agency named as the Space Environment Report of 2022, it literally mentioned that on a daily basis we are able to map and we are able to have a look on about 30,000 space debris that is floating on low earth orbit. So that is the gravity of the debris that is functional, that is prevalent in the low earth orbit essentially making it a junkyard. Then there is something known as Kessler syndrome which will accentuate the situation. Why? Because of, because of the rotation motion as all of them will be moving freely in the low earth orbit it might be possible that they will start colliding with each other. Collisions of two satellites meaning that they might also scrap off some micro components. So this will also give rise to a lot of micro debris in the space. A lot of micro debris along with these debris will give rise to overpopulation event in the space which means because of the collision it will have a cascading impact on the growth of debris and as a result the entire low earth orbit, orbit will become unfit for the use, unfit for the satellite launches. And therefore, this is known as Kessler syndrome, which is one of the biggest rising concerns of the growth of debris in the space. Next is, it also possesses risk to the critical space assets. For example, the functional satellites or the functional missions that we want to deploy. Specifically, if you talk about some of the satellites, there was this Russian Cosmos satellite 1275. And this was the first ever satellite to be destroyed and destructed by the collision of a space debris. 
and alongside it possesses risk to many other functional satellites many other functional projects as well so therefore what we need is a global coalition where everybody sits together and think upon this newly created waste hazard in the space now we have already talked about the space debris now we will before moving into what is poem platform with the help of which isro ensured that the space debris is not created by the exposat mission we'll first understand what is the exposat mission so exposat mission essentially stands for x ray polarimeter satellite so a polarimeter is being used why because we want to we want to assess we want to analyze and detect the x rays and that will be help that would that would be actualized with the help of a polarimeter something which is able to polarize the light waves coming and with the help of this polarization or this polarized meter we'll be able to calculate the amount of polarization that a particular x ray which probably x rays if you talk about the electromagnetic spectrum it lies somewhere over here which means it is having very high energy very high frequency of course it must be emanating from very high energetic objects for example the black holes the neutron stars the magnetrons etc and as a result of this when they are moving towards the earth when they try to reach the earth they also go across multiple galaxies multiple active galactic nuclei and the other concepts and therefore it causes polarization in their orientation now by understanding this degree of polarization this deviation in their alignment the moment we understand that we'll be able to predict from where this x ray is coming and this will help us to unsolve many of the mysteries of the universe so our intention is to study the x rays so this is basically to analyze the amount of polarization that has occurred in the x rays coming from the black hole or from any other bright celestial bodies which are spinning at very very high speeds so it was put it was installed at the low earth orbit with a 6 degree inclination about 650 kilometers away from the earth and it was carried by this launcher PSLV because this is a polarized polarizer and this is a polarimeter which means its main job is to assess is to be watchful is to have remote sensing that can be best done in the exposure of sunlight and therefore it was incorporated in the in basically the polar orbit and that is why pslv was deployed now talking about the mission life mission life is up to 5 years and it has got two payloads one which is going to calculate the amount of x rays coming it's going to remote sense the x rays and second one is going to check the degree of polarization so we have got x ray polarimeter and x ray spectroscopy and timing which is expect and polix and these questions can be asked to you that recently seen in news these terms relate to which of the following missions it's about the exposat and what is the significance significance is to resolve uh, the different uh, aspects of the universe by understanding the x ray and the degree of polarization it has underwent so i hope we have understood this now when we are talking about the exposat mission we have also talked about the launching vehicle which is pslv how does pslv which is also the workhorse of isro why because this is the most reliable rocket launcher has successfully completed more than 90% of the total missions it was made for so of course the pslv works in four stages in the first stage is where it lifts off from the launching station with its primary satellite then moving upon the second and third stage it tries to it tries to shoot off some of its component in order to ease of the waste the good thing about these two waste the waste that is emanated from this launching vehicle on stage 1 and stage on stage 2 and stage 3 is basically that they burn into the earth's atmosphere when they are trying to fall down and as a result of this they do not end up as space debris the problematic part is a, is a stage 4 of pslv where it brings the primary satellite into the desired orbit station and at the same time separates itself by becoming a space junk in itself so what isro has decided that we are going to recycle this space junk and utilize it for another 6 months by installing some of the observatories in it some of the experiments in it so therefore what is a poem platform poem platform is nothing but the fourth stage pslv uh, your space a uh, junk which is essentially recycled in the form of an experimental module or an orbital platform for conducting experiments in the space this will last up to 6 months 
it is going to be powered from the solar panels the navigation that it is using is also very interesting we are going to use our own indigenous indigenously made navigation system we are not using gps here it is navic also known as irn ss constellation of seven satellites it is going to be controlled by a control system which is navigation guidance and control system basically ensuring that its momentum its stability is maintained with quite a good accuracy in the space so that it doesn't fall off the, therefore it is controlled its, its mind is controlled by navigation guidance and control system and what about the functioning so as we have seen that when it reaches the fourth stage when the satellite the rocket launcher reaches the fourth stage and the moment it dissociates itself with the satellite then this is the satellite and this platform is now going to be onboarded with some of the experimental modules which are going to perform experiments in the space which means if it is active it is not a space junk so for next six months we have avoided space debris now a very important editorial got featured in the indian express with the name of a maritime bastion this bastion is nothing but the island island states island union territories of andaman and nicobar island so the context is that government reports have suggested that there is rising and heightened focus of the government on the strategic islands of andaman and nicobar so what makes them strategic why are they important why do we need to put an impetus towards our developmental initiatives over there we'll assess all of this first we'll understand andaman and nicobar islands is basically a union territory comprising of two broad group of islands the andaman and the nicobar which is separated by a 10 degree water channel now this also reminded me of another fact that which waterway separates the male which is in the lakshadweep island from maldives this is the 8 degree channel so kindly remember both of these channels not going back to andaman and nicobar these are basically a group of about 800 and 36 islands out of which not all of them are habited only about 38 islands are habited now if you talk about the significance of andaman and nicobar it essentially comes from its strategic location can you see the placement in the map it is it is it is there it is placed in an intersection between your bay of bengal then of course your indian ocean then some elements of south china sea is also close to it also it is uh, it is at the intersection of the pacific ocean so because it lies in the in the intersection of all these areas therefore all the key players of the indo pacific considers this area as a very strategic area strategically important area for them it has been recognized by india by usa by france by japan and they are all very very keen to seek development over there so that they can put their foothold in the strategic location of andaman and nicobar island so first of all the basic thing is its strategic location that it is in the integration at a, at the integration at the convergence of very very important seas very important water bodies so therefore it is an important fulcrum of the indo pacific policies which is the main global focus the main theater of the geopolitics today next it also connects your south asia with the southeast asia southeast asia is propelling economically and this is needed interconnection and integration with southeast asia is needed by south asia as well and that integration can be very well provided with the help of andaman and nicobar because it is in intersection of both of them as you can see that the northernmost point is very very close to myanmar and the southernmost point is very very close to your indonesia and as a result you can see that it has got another strategic significance with respect to economic integration of these two geographical areas next it has a very very vast exclusive economic zone about 30% of india's exclusive economic zone lies where lies in the andaman and nicobar and therefore it has got huge amount of marine resources for us and also a lot of economic viability now it is also homeland to rich biodiversity and also various tribes in fact five of the pvtgs particularly vulnerable tribal groups of india have their homeland in the andaman and nicobar islands only these names are great andamanese jarvas ongi shompens and sentinelis these pvtgs are very important because they have been asked in upsc prelims now it has also got very very rich biodiversity as you can see that it is a kind of it has a very broad eco tone eco tone the concept that you read a transition zone between the sea between the water and the land so therefore it is very very rich in the terms of biodiversity therefore it has got huge amount of forest resources because first of all it receives lot of rainfall and second it grows in a tropical environment and therefore lot of tropical rainforest are also seen so it is rich in forest ecosystem it is rich in marine ecosystem and the other biodiversity forms so these are some of the significant 
significances which highlights the fact that india needs to put a great emphasis towards the conservation and managing development along with conservation for andaman and nicobar so what are the challenges associated with the development of it which we also need to take into regard first of all is the security concern see it is rather uninhabited it is a very isolated land from the mainland of india so therefore it itself struggles with a lot of internal security issues so for example it sees a lot of illegal migration from the littoral states of the bay of bengal for example bangladesh for example myanmar they come and often they come and do smugglings in areas where uh the regions are largely uninhabited so therefore illegal migration is a very huge concern for them second because it has got very very a huge access a wide pool of forest resources of marine resources is it not possible to do easy smuggling over here so a lot of poaching a lot of smuggling is also done smuggling especially in the uninhabited area especially in the terms of arms and the other narcotics that is also very very prevalent in andaman and nicobar so these are some of the governance challenges and more than that these are the security concerns with india also has then it is prone to natural disasters you must have seen that because it is very very close to south china sea to indian ocean also to pacific so all the hazards which are related to the land all the hazards which are related to the oceans it is prone to both of them and therefore you can see that in 2004 it got struck with one of the worst earthquakes also because it is in the tectonically active region it saw a lot of tsunamis as well in the 2007 tsunami was so grave that it caused loss of up to 90% of the mangroves and 20% of the population were of the nicobar island so because it is lying somewhere near the tectonically active zone so therefore they are always prone to natural disasters second there is a huge geopolitical power play going on right now because as you understand that the indo pacific region is a growing epicenter of the world right now and you can also observe it from the activities of china where it is trying to intrude into the territories which are nearer to indian ocean so you have seen hamban tota port you have seen gwadar port activities etc so because we if we want to counter these ambitions of china if we want to dominate if we want to become the net security provider in this region we would definitely want to develop this island nation and take it for our advantage so this is the immense need this provides us for the immense need of developing pursuing development in andaman and nicobar so how do we enhance development then first of all is to empower the communities Com community is the first line of defense for any sovereign state so therefore em by empowering communities by providing them more employment opportunities in this rather isolated island we need to provide them with better and more formal and more ling uh, your handicraft industries we need to provide them with more agricultural revenues for example we can allow them and we can incentivize the government can incentivize them to pursue palm cultivation etc then they should be they should be trained for disaster preparedness because we have so we have seen the vulnerability of this region towards disasters and then this can also be revamped as a very important crucial ship and repair industry because a lot of sh ships actually pass through and across andaman and nicobar island so it can be this opportunity can be utilized and ship industry and repair industry can be built a lot of it is now concentrated in the west coast of india specifically in gujarat and maharashtra so this can be shifted from shifted from there to andaman and nicobar now next we need to improve the security governance of the island itself by doing away and by taking care of the activities like smuggling like poaching etc this can be done by doing by doing proper research and development research and development which will help us to enhance the capacity of our military personnel of our navy personnel and this will help them to combat such issues more severely and aggressively next is to perform infra development one of the biggest challenges faced by the two island uh, by the two island states that we have the lakshadweep and the andaman is that they are very very disconnected from the mainland india so the need of the are naturally becomes to integrate them with the mainland how do you do that you cannot have transmission lines copper copper cables over here but alternatively we can deploy the underground or underwater optical fiber cables and a project has already been taken up by the government of india for both the island states so this is submarine optical fiber cable scheme where submarine optical fiber cables will be uh, will be connected or will be installed that, that will be connecting these islands these two islands from the mainland india this will also help these islands to get or to get the access of initiatives like digital india 
this will also help them to integrate with the mainland market all as well so we need to pursue infrastructure development we also finally need to ensure that there is sustainable island development framework we understand that we need to develop security related infrastructure here so that this strategic location can be utilized for the benefit of india but at the same time that shouldn't come with a cost on the ecosystem cost on the habitations of the local people so the rights of indigenous people should be appreciated should be upheld at the same time ecosystem should also be taken care of and at a convergence all of these lies the sustainable island development framework work for the development of andaman and nicobar island an example of this could be the project great nicobar which is considered by which is taken up by the government of india so these are some of the methods through which we can we will be able to empower and develop the andaman and nicobar island in the next topic we will understand the progress of india in combating malnutrition so what is the context that recently indian institute of public health hyderabad has analyzed the data set from the national family health survey fifth and taking that data clues from that data and the previous data they have created comparatives among different nutritional indicators prevalent under children under the year of 3 years of age so the evaluation of nutritional indicators are published by the institute so therefore we'll be understanding what is malnutrition and how india is performing in it so first of all let's understand what is malnutrition contrary to the popular understanding that it is some kind of defi deficiency it is not just deficiency it is not just deficiency but also excess excess in what nutritional intake and nutritional utilization both the things are very very important so what if deficiency happens then a person may grow stunted stunting will happen wasting will happen person may grow anemic but what if excess nutrition is absorbed then in that case obesity can happen obesity will cause cardiovascular diseases and some of the other non communicable heart related diseases so therefore it becomes very important to address malnutrition concerns especially in india where it goes through a double burden of malnutrition as you can see that it is causing both because of deficiency so deficiency can cause underweight and at the same time in india because of the poor dietary practices we also observe excess intake of nutrition as a result we see overweight or obesity as a problem as well so in india we don't face with one burden of malnutrition but with the double burden of malnutrition alongside it because of the poor quality of food that we consume the dietary practices that we have we don't include salads and the green vegetables and the fruits etc as a result of which we are heavily deficient in the micronutrients micronutrients like vitamins and minerals which are very essential for providing us immunity for regulating the overall health and also ensuring proper growth and development at the right age now this deficiency of micronutrients is not very very visible therefore they are known as hidden hunger so India also goes through hidden hunger so india has got double burden of malnutrition and hidden hunger so naturally the statistics the nutritional indicators the nutritional performance of ours will not be very great there are two metrics to understand how how a country is performing in malnutrition these two metrics are amount of wasting and the amount of stunting which is observed in the children of that particular country so let's say we have three boys a b and c all of them having 10 years of age so for a 10 year old there should be certain height and certain weight which will qualify that person to be a healthy individual a healthy child so let's say a is very very healthy okay a is healthy because he is having the right height and the right weight for his age but look at b b is having same height as that of a at the same time he is having very very less weight as compared to a and therefore he is again not considered as a person who's having or who's getting the right nutrition he'll also be considered as malnutrition now this phenomena where you are having low weight or anybody is having low weight as compared to their height then that is known as situation of wasting and when somebody is healthy enough healthy as same as a but at the same time is stunted having lower height which means low height low height as compared to their weight as compared to their age that is known as the process of stunting so how does india performs in that do you know that one third of the total world's stunted children are there in india 
that is the amount of stunting we have what about the wasting half of the total world's wasted children are in india that is a grave concern of malnutrition going on now because malnutrition is something which needs to be dealt with and there should be holistic programs in each and every country especially in the poor countries middle income countries and therefore therefore united nations along with who has initiated the decade of nutrition 2016 to 2025 and therefore you will see a lot of schemes expedited by india in this decade why because this is the decade of nutrition which you can also use in your mains answers now talking about the factors which influences the nutritional status well there are many but we will be limiting ourselves to the discussion of this editorial so in this editorial where the data set has been taken from the national family health survey that was uh, taken back in 1992 this is being con compared with the latest national family health survey of 2020 so what are the major determinants of these nutritional status first of all it is the maternal education and second the child's gender of course it depends and it decides what kind of awareness do a person has about his dietary practices his or her dietary practices and at the second time it also ensures the amount of availability of the food and the basic nutrition and sadly that is dependent on gender these days especially in india so therefore the major determinants are maternal education and the child's gender the performance is observed that yes while india has has improved a long way especially in the last decade after upcoming of lot of government schemes it was still seen that wasting showed a marginal increase in india the reason being again these social factors and not just the government intervention so is government intervention enough to deal with enough to deal with malnutrition in india no we need community led efforts as well so therefore we need to ensure that these two determinants are taken care of it also observed that there are certain regional disparities and regional factors as well which influences the nutritional status so first of all it was observed that some of the poor states very poor states where population was overcrowding and the environment was not very uh, was not very hygienic in those areas like bihar and meghalaya higher prevalence of malnutrition was observed as compared to manipur and punjab where the residents were having better per capita income and their overall atmosphere and environment was also more hygienic next the consistent performers have been chalked out to be chhattisgarh jharkhand and uttarakhand so these smaller states have actually been consistent performers in achieving their targets each and every year ever since the portion abhiyan came and the anemia muk bharat campaign came so these are some of the analysis from the editorial now the point to be noted is what should be the way forward to address the malnutrition and what are the government schemes so first of all government started with the integrated child development services scheme in 1990s where it provided holistic management providing vaccination providing nutritional support providing maternal benefits as well there is pm matra vandana yojana as well which also provides certain certain money to or cash incentives to the female especially the pregnant women so that they can take care of their nutritional security and also of their child so integrated child development services scheme along with pm matra vandana yojana matra vandana yojana so these two schemes are there next the midday meal scheme speci specially targeting the school children which also incentivize the children to go to school by also providing them right nutrition next is anemia muk bharat launched in 2018 this ensures that india which is having more than 20 percent of the total global world's burden in fact if you talk about the number of people who are suffering from anemia more than more than 55% of the total women of India are actually anemic. And if you talk about the total average, the total population or adult population is anemic. That is anemic is about 30%. So that is the gravity of anemia going on to address this, to address this because of iron deficiencies. Anemia Mukt Bharat was launched to provide certain nutritional supplements and interventions. And with the target to decline anemia, by 1 to 3 percent on an annual basis then there was national food security act which provided you legal guarantee to access nutritional food so this was you this is what you get from national food security act then there is portion abhiyan so portion abhiyan was launched by the government of india to take care of the nutritional needs of both the mother and the child so portion abhiyan was also launched in this regard but what is the way forward way forward is not just the government schemes this is what i want to put forward way forward is to work across three tri-junction one is where the government is giving push 
certain financial incentives to the healthcare institutions or to the healthcare workers or providing you nutritional support but at the same time we need to take care of the other two pillars as well first is to have better foods better foods at the very first place which means we can also provide bio fortified milk bio fortified fruits bio fortified products and grains like golden rice having vitamin a then we can also ensure that the food uh, that we have is having more nutritional content and this food is also a quality food this is also in accordance with the right dietary practices to ensure this the fsci has launched eat right campaign then once we have better food that's not enough we also need to take certain measures in case of acute issues of malnutrition so for that better healthcare should be there healthcare can be best provided with the help of community interventions community which is motivated to preserve the hygiene of the area community which is ready to give proper preparedness and response towards any acute malnutrition case and to educate especially the mothers and the children regarding the importance of their dietary practices so if we take Take care of these three pillars. We will be able to ensure that our Vikasad Bharat is also going to be a pushed Bharat. Quickly coming to the next topic, we are going to study the highlights from CDS Lok Niti Survey, survey which has which is going to give us some insights on to the public perception about the overall governance in India. So multiple surveys were created. We are not going to talk about the political aspect, the political surveys, but. some of the surveys which are very good and they can be used directly in your main data facts and for main substantiation these are first of all this survey which said that majority believe that india belongs to citizen of all religion equally which means that they respected our plurality they respected university in diversity so it was observed that 79% of the india voted that india belongs to citizen of all religion equally and not just hindus what is the reason for india culminating into best example one of the best examples of salad bowl or one of the best examples of unity and diversity multiple reasons first of all our historical linkages we've been ruled by muslim rulers hindu rulers we've been ruled by british people so therefore we are acquainted to all these cultures very well we have imbibed them in our own culture so we are historically somehow uh, we've been understanding in that regards second is the constitutional framework which provides certain principles of equality mentioned in article 15 and uh, mentioned in article 14 to 18 and then we have uh, protection against discrimination and then we have got right to practice religion from article 25 to 28 we've also got certain tenets of equality and secularism speci- specifically mentioned in our preamble as well so we have got constitutional safeguards to express our religion at the same time protect our religion and respect others religion because the state also does so so constitutional framework also strengthens the feeling of unity in diversity second economic inter- interdependence so basically we are a huge population and we also respect each other's religion because they also help us economically let's say diwali festival is celebrated eid festival is celebrated christmas festival is celebrated they actually provide impetus and economic boom or a boom in the demand of the economy so therefore it leverages the indian economy festivals are very very important they are respected by all and they also aid our economy do you know the example of kheer bhawani mela so this this mela is very exceptional example where it is celebrated by the hindus but all the preparations are done by the muslims so such things are happening such cultural cohesion is already present because we have mutual respect for each other and we have been integrated via multiple multiple scriptures via multiple sculptures via multiple artist arts genres so therefore because there are social cohesions cultural cohesions economic cohesions so we appreciate the unity in diversity next is about the election now this is a saddening figure which you can also use in analysis of election commission and the need for electoral reforms so listen to it very very carefully trust in election commission of india has declined because when they talked about the trust uh, it was it was about the decline in trust was reported to more than 51% then public perception on the electronic voting machine manipulation has also got more solidified these days so a lot has been reported by it has also increased it has said that uh, 17% have said that it is actually happening and 28% are saying that somewhat it's happening so eventually majority is claiming that the evm tampering is actually a reality of the day so what are the issues with elections in india first of all question on the electoral integrity question on the body which is creating it question on the independence of the body 
that is election commission of india it has got political biases whenever it wants to impose model code of conduct it becomes very partial in that regard with respect to the ruling party and the opposition party then evm controversies have ever be have been eternal controversies ever since the commencement of evm about its tampering about booth capturing etc then electoral roll irregularities have also been seen the list the electoral roll that is created has got inclusion and exclusion errors so this also depletes voters trust as to whether the rightful person is voting or not or whether their their right to vote is being exercised rightfully or not so voter suppression is also happening because with the use of violence that has also been seen across many districts especially the tribal districts then political bias and lack of independence of the election commission of india has been observed the funding transparency has always been a bone of bone of discontent so all of these factors raises concerns about the electoral process the transparency of the same and therefore has led to the decline of trust just before the poll is about to commence next opinion is on the uniform civil code opinion across different castes and communities have said that many of them are not aware of ucc and most of them have said that this law is going to empower the women so can you now tell me put up this exercise for your homework that write down the benefits and the challenges for adopting ucc uniform civil code in india under article 44 of dpsp it has been mentioned in the indian constitution that state should make an endeavor to finally adopt uniform civil code across all the religion across all the genders and and regions as well but that has not seen the light of the day so what are the benefits and what are the challenges you can try to attempt it now can we have a quick briefing about the ladakh protest and the hunger strike going on so we are going to study the main highlights of the ladakh issue in this particular session So Ladakh is basically a union territory which got its status in the year 2019 when the status of Jammu and Kashmir as a state was taken back and it was made a union territory along with Leh Ladakh. What are the key demands? The key demands in Ladakh is basically to have enhanced autonomy because they feel that they have got certain cultural differences as compared to Jammu and Kashmir and also because Jammu Kashmir takes place uh, takes away a large share of their resources. So therefore and their their overall budget which they get a large pie of it is given to jammu and kashmir by the government so accruing to these biases there is demand that there should be six schedule six schedule provides for autonomy to the autonomous district councils and it is currently present in the state of assam in the state of tripura in the state of mizoram in the state of meghalaya and it basically protects the cultural identity of the tribal people over there by providing them administrative autonomy fine so that is being demanded and second is the demand of statehood away from jammu and kashmir next what is the characteristic of this strike that sonam wangchuk the famous environmental activist and he is also responsible for building the ice stupas to provide water security so sonam wangchuk hunger strike is going on and so what are the reasons behind these demands what are the particular reasons if we assess first of all is the cultural difference that they feel with jammu and kashmir second the neglect and the dis- and the discrimination they feel from the from the point of view of center government so they feel that in 1951 to 55 the budgetary allocation that the ladakh received was almost zero and the situation has not improved even today so even today if you see the per capita funding is 5 to 6 times less than that of jammu and kashmir so they feel particularly deprived and as a result they are asking these key demands also after 2019 act there was binary reaction from the ladakh people against the against the union territory status that was given to it because they felt that a lot of autonomy from their hand will be given away to the central government so of course the binary reaction was such that the buddhist majority or the buddhist community was in support they were having celebratory fervor for the ut status whereas the muslim community of the ladakh were opposing it and there is also fear of unchecked development at a very very ecologically fragile region of ladakh which is already depraved of a lot of socio economic indicators it's not having proper food security not proper uh, infrastructures water security etc and at the same time if government will try to have unchecked development it will not only lead to degradation of the ecosystem but the encroachment will also call for cultural dilution among the people so they are wanting what the protection of their indigenous rights the protection of their cultural identity protection of environment
Now we'll be quickly moving towards the prelim snippet. In the first one, we will read about the next CAR-19, which is India's first ever CAR T cell therapy indigenously developed. So who has developed it? It's basically Immuno ACT, which is an incubator startup under IIT Bombay. It is created and finally it has got the approval to be used in India as well. So if you talk about the chimeric antigen receptor cell therapy, which is named as next CAR-19, it's basically working on strengthening the T cells. So what are the T cells? T cells are a part of adaptive immunity, which provides, which first of all identifies the antigens, antigens which can potentially cause some harm to our body. They identify such antigens, they activate the B cells to attack them. They also create cytotoxic T cells and these cytotoxic T cells themselves kill off the antigen. So these are the functions which are performed by T cell. But what if T cell has become dumb enough to not properly recognize a particular kind of threat to the body? Let's say a kind of cancer. So it basically provides the T cells the better capability to First of all, be aware of the antigen and then to attack the antigen. This will help us to deal with some of the blood cancers, which are not very easily identifiable in the body. So therefore, this therapy will be used. And this is known as chimeric antigen because here we are going to infuse. We are going to perform a gene modification, a genetic modification where a different part of DNA or gene segment is taken out from some other organism and then put inside this gene in order to in order to strengthen the T cells. So therefore this is known as a chimeric and this is antigen receptor because it is made to it is made for the T cells who are about to detect the antigen something which can cause uh, harm to our body. So this is about the CAR 19 next CAR 19 next is Karens and Kachin. So these both of them are the ethnic minorities which are there in the Southeast Asia. So specifically in, uh, in Myanmar and Thailand, they are located. So these are ethnic groups of Southeast Asia. They have got their origin from the Mongolian desert or there are other theories which suggest they also come from the Tibetan plateau. And from there, they have habitated towards the Myanmar region, the Southeast Asia, basically Myanmar, the Northeast of Myanmar, and also the Thailand region. If you get asked, because such questions can be asked in the form of match the column. So you have to map it with Myanmar. Now, they are majority in Buddhist and then some of them have also been forcefully converted. Some of them have been converted due to colonial practices, etc. So there are multiple religion practices by them, but practiced by them, but the majority is Buddhist. They have in their society got strong gender biases against especially women. Women are not allowed to do a lot of things. So they have got strong gender bias and they are asking for autonomy. Autonomy in the form of a different state, an independent state in Myanmar. And this is known as Kothuli. So Kothuli can also be asked and this is an autonomous region like how the Naga insurgents, the Naga land insurgents are asking for a separate Naga limb in India. They are asking for Kothuli. So kindly remember this. Next one is the heat waves. What do we mean by heat wave? It is the prolonged period of very hot temperatures or very hot weathers which can have adverse impact on human health, on environment and on biodiversity. How do you define heat wave? Criteria is given by IMD, Indian Meteorological Department. Set a cutoff temperature. The maximum limit is 40 degrees for plains and 30 degrees for hills which means if there is prolonged suspension or prolonged sustenance of 40 degrees in plains then heat waves are predicted over here and if 30 degrees have reached and have sus has sustained for 3 to 4 days in hills then this is again considered as heat wave situation in the hills. What are the causes? Multiple ones are there. First of all is the global warming which has increased prolonged exposure to heat and warming for us. Next is high atmospheric pressure systems in such places which encloses the evaporation of this heat and therefore the dissipation of heat cannot take place and as a result it get enclosed in the form of a very intense hot oven so therefore it also aggravates the heat wave next is the urban heat island effect because we are concretizing so concrete has got huge susceptibility towards containing absorbing heat it doesn't get cooled off very very easily as compared to soil urban heat island effect, use of concrete, use of building materials, those are also increasing the average temperatures of urban areas as compared to rural areas, also increasing the likelihood towards heat waves. Then the drought and the dry conditions, if you don't have enough water, enough precipitation, of course, heat waves will aggravate. So here, this is about the heat waves. Next, we are going to talk about Asian Development Bank. It 
was originated in 1966. It currently comprises of 68 members, and most of the members, about 40 members, are from Indo-Pacific region. Which means not all the members of ADB are from Indo-Pacific region, as you can see, some are from Europe as well. And so, therefore, uh, we cannot say that all of them are the members of. Uh, the indo-pacific region only so this is asian development bank and it is headquartered in manila philippines it is headquartered in manila which is in philippines if you talk about the shareholding so shareholding goes like this so first of all the highest shareholder is japan second highest one is usa then india is the fourth highest shareholder shareholders are important because a similar question on aiib was asked by upsc in the prelims examination so be mindful of the fact so this was all about today's current affair discussion hope you have liked it all the very best for your exam thank you so much and have a nice day